All right, we might get started. Hi everyone, my name is Donna Luckman and I'm a director with the Coalition for Community Energy. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming from today from Melbourne. So I'm on the land of the Wandry people of the Kulon Nation. As the traditional custodians of surrounding lands and waterways, I wanna pay the, my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all the First Nations communities across the nation from where all you are attending as well. I also like to send my best wishes to people in New South Wales who at the moment are struggling with the floods, especially for a lot of those communities who have just come off the black summer as well with bushfires. So while we're here today, today we've got four fantastic speakers who are all on the forefront of advocating for community energy. Countries across the world have pledged to meet net zero emissions by 2050 and ENGIE will play a key role in meeting this target. In Australia, several initiatives are demonstrating the central role communities can play in transitioning to energy and decarbonising our lives. The challenge that we face is now building that capacity across the country for a just and timely transition that needs, meets communities' needs as well as their aspirations. To address this challenge today, we're gonna to take a bit of a deep dive into the different policy and campaigns that are happening around community energy at the moment. And we're quite fortunate that we've got quite a bit of time today. So we're going to have our four presenters give like a quick seven minute um, presentation on the campaigns that they're working on. And then we'll be actually handing over to you. So we've actually got just under an hour of time for questions from people and also an opportunity for the panelists to have a bit of a general discussion on the state of play with community energy and advocacy in Australia at the moment. If you haven't used this webinar functionality before, the chat function is on the bottom left of your screen. And we'd love to see a lot of chat that'll be going on during the presentations as well. And give the shout out from where you're coming from too today. There's also the Q&A function. So if you do have a question for our panelists, especially while you're listening to the presentations, please pop in a, a question into that Q&A. There's also the ability for you to give a, a thumbs up to a question that you think is really fantastic and that you want up definitely to be answered by ourselves and the panelists. So have a look at the other questions that are going ahead as well. Just also a heads up that this actual presentation has been recorded as well. So we're making sure that we always have um, succinct questions and also we're joining this um, questions in good faith and making sure that we're clear on making all our panelists and all our attendees welcome through the process as well. So let's get straight into it. So our first presentation today is from Helen Haynes. So Helen Haynes is the independent member for the Victorian electorate of Indi, which is quite a hot spot of community energy in Northeastern Victoria. Over the past 12 months, Helen has led a co-design process on developing a national power plan, which has led to the table in the Australian Local Power Agency Bill in Parliament on February the 22nd. So I'll pass it over to Helen to give us an update on the national power plan and the bill. So welcome, Helen. Thanks so much, Donna. And um, my best wishes to, I think there's around 200 people, is there not, um, online today. So wherever you are, um, a very big hello from me. I'm coming to you today from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country in Canberra. I'm, I'm in Parliament right now and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am today and pay my respects to Elders past and present and pay my respects to any Aboriginal people who may be on the line. Um, and a big uh, good day to, to, to Taryn and Christy and to Andrew who are uh, also presenting today and I've, I've worked with uh, I've worked with so many people across the nation on community energy over the past 12 months and if any of you are out there uh, on this call and uh, participated in my co-design process for the local power plan thank you and I want you to know I'm still really at it here um, so here's something I guess that you all know but I want to tell you and and that is that uh, the regions, regional Australia, are really the ones that could benefit most from what is the inevitable boom in renewable energy. I am a regional MP and I'm absolutely committed to the prosperity of rural and regional Australians. And I see uh, the renewable energy boom as one of the greatest, greatest opportunities we have in front of us if, we, if we're smart and if we have the policy levers that enable us to truly get the benefit from this. The slide that you're seeing around right now is a, is a visual representation of the renewable energy zones uh, in Australia. And uh, you can see from this that they are right across the regions. Um, in the past, regional Australia has, 
has looked to agriculture for its prosperity. It's looked to gold rushes, wool booms, um, but I'm suggesting that really the next boom for, for people living in the regions could be the production of renewable energy if, uh, if in fact we make sure the money flows uh, into those regional communities. In fact, uh, I'm fond of saying that for every electron that's generated in regional Australia, there should be money coming back into the pockets of regional Australians. We know that in uh, the renewable energy zones of New South Wales alone, there's already attracted billions of dollars in private investment. And I keep telling uh, anyone who will listen in this place, in the federal government, that uh, we have in front of us an opportunity for regional development that simply uh, hasn't been realised. So, Donna, if I could just have the, uh, the next slide, please. Thanks so much. Um, so what we know uh, is the full benefit is really not reaching the communities where renewables are being generated. Um, Community-driven renewables at the moment lack a comprehensive funding stream at the federal level. And existing grant opportunities, I, I learned this during my co-design process, are really piecemeal. Local community uh, energy groups have to compete against each other for, for opportunistic grants. Uh, sometimes they're not ready uh, to put in a submission when the grant opportunity opens and, and then they have to wait for another year or more before they get another chance. And we know um, that these uh, grant opportunities are wildly oversubscribed, so there's not enough for everyone. And it's, it's, it really is holding back community energy from being scaled up to the level that it truly could be. We also know that uh, community organisations, sporting clubs, fire stations, CWAs, public housing um, have real issues with affordable energy supply and they can't uh, access grant opportunities to install um, locally based renewables. We also know um, that while some companies have a local procurement policy, many companies do not. And there are missed opportunities in regional towns and communities uh, for procurement, for local jobs, for opportunities for training and real benefit um, in terms of long-term value from these new projects. And we also know uh, that so much of the profits from the big scale renewable energy projects uh, are not coming into local communities. In fact, often uh, money's indeed going offshore. Um, and while we know that there's a couple of examples of large corporations who invite communities to co-invest, um, that's in fact a rarity and not the norm. Uh, we also know that as a nation, we're not investing nationally in the development of local skills, yet there is a real opportunity and future for new skills, new technological skills, and particularly for young people in regional Australia to develop these skills for the construction, for the maintenance of renewable energy projects. So at the moment, um, we're really not seeing the benefit on the ground in regional communities uh, of, of what is now 25% uh, of, of all of our energy is coming from renewables, but we're not seeing the benefit in the regions. Okay, next, next slide, please, Donna. Thank you. So, you know, what to do about this? Uh, we, we could grumble, uh, we could try uh, uh, amongst the many, many local groups that are doing fantastic work. And, and as Donna said, in Indi, um, we have 13 community energy groups. So they're doing incredible work. Uh, they're actually leading the way in, in so many uh, instances. We've got community energy group uh, down in Euroa, which is responding to energy insecurity. They're on the edge of the grid. Uh, we've got Totally Renewable Yak and Danda, which is, uh, is well and truly advanced and will achieve its goal of being totally renewable by 2022. We've got the little town of Coriong that was absolutely smashed during the recent black summer bushfires who'd lost their power for a couple of weeks because they've got a vulnerable single line that goes down to Wodonga. Uh, they've been successful in $3 million of bushfire recovery grant to set up a microgrid and a community battery. So we've got things really happening. Of course, we've got some fantastic examples around the nation, Hepburn Wind, of course, uh, the national leader, Denmark over in WA, countless other, other examples. Uh, Aboriginal, Aboriginal communities in Northern Territory, again, looking towards uh, community energy to solve some of their security problems. But what we really need is a dedicated strategic program from the federal government to make sure that we can actually scale this up. 
So in doing the work uh, for the local power plan, and, and we kicked this off in the, in the depths of a COVID lockdown uh, in Victoria, put out a discussion paper, had a hundred submissions uh, from all around the nation, from some of you on this line. Uh, and one of the things that was clear to us was that we actually needed a standalone Australian local power agency. And as you'd be all well aware, right now we have ARENA and we have the CEFC, um, but local communities, regional communities in particular, but local community groups are locked out of accessing funds uh, through those two bodies. So what I've proposed and indeed introduced legislation to Parliament, as Donna said, on the 22nd of February, uh, was to, to create a trinity, really, to add to, the, to ARENA and CF, CFC to create the Australian Local Power Agency. And this agency would do three things. Fundamentally, the first thing it would do would be to act locally, to establish 50 local power hubs, local community energy power hubs around the nation, power hubs that would have the technical expertise and be fund holders to enable community groups in their patch to access money when they're ready to do so and have the skills and the smarts available locally so they could get on and do it. We know that's an issue. It was what uh, our, our submitters told us. It's what we heard about in the 14 workshops that I ran during this period. Uh, so those 50 power hubs uh, is the first component of that. The second component of a local power agency is to address the glaring gap in our energy profile, and that's mid-scale renewable energy production. There's a real unmet opportunity there for local communities, uh, for local government to partner with private companies and produce energy at a mid-scale. And I'm proposing that if, uh, if there's 51% local uh, a local uh, buy into that from a local government or community groups, then the government should replicate its own UNGI scheme and, uh, and underwrite community energy at that mid-scale level. And then thirdly, uh, the final plank uh, of the Australian Local Power Agency Bill is to ensure that the big scale uh, renewable projects invite local communities to partner with them through a co-investment scheme offering offering a 20% uh, 20 co-investment. Now, if they can't get it, that's okay. It doesn't hold up the project, but the legislation uh, would ensure that they make that offer. And that's the kind of policy lever that we know has worked in other nations. We know that uh, when communities are invited to the table and a part of the uh, of the prosperity of new projects, then they really get on board. They have, they then have uh, agency and control about where that uh, where that that project is going to be. Uh, they feel empowered and they get some profits. Most importantly, we know, for example, that in Germany right now, ten percent of all renewable energy. Uh, projects in Germany are owned by farmers and an additional 30% owned by local communities. Just think about that in regional Australia. Just think about that in terms of prosperity and a new income stream. So they're the three components of the Australian Local Power Agency. I've introduced the bills into parliament and I'm delighted to tell you that um, I asked for those bills to go to a parliamentary inquiry, to the Environment and Energy Inquiry, and just this very day, hot off the press, they have, uh, they have accepted my bills for an inquiry. So I'm really excited about that. And when the time comes, when we know when that inquiry will open, um, I'll be really asking you uh, to get involved in putting a submission to that inquiry. So I'll make it a wrap there, Donna. Great, thank you very much, Helen. And um, I, I hear that you're going to have to leave us a little bit early. So I was wondering if we've got a bit longer time, but we might take questions for you now, if that's okay. I think so, that'd be really good. That'd, that'd yeah. work for me, Donna. It's the, uh, it's the pressure of parliament today. So it'd be great <laughs> to take a few now. Yeah, not a problem. Just, and, and great news to hear about as well, that you know, that it actually is going to go to an inquiry level. So I'm just going to start with my first question is like politically, how are you feeling about the bill? Like, you know, what's the conversations that you're having around at Parliament at the moment around it? Yeah, Donna, um, well, I think the fact that uh, it's been accepted now for an inquiry is a really good sign. Um, th those inquiry committees can say no to private members' bills if they choose to. Um, so that's a great start. That's a bipartisan committee, um, members from, from all, all stripes of, of uh, government, uh, Labor and, uh, and uh, independence as well. So really pleased about that. 
Um, I've also I've met with the, the Prime Minister about this several times and, and many times with the uh, Energy Minister, Minister Taylor, and I've got a good hearing every time. They see the issue that I'm trying to address and um, they've been uh, really interested in the policy framework I've put put forward. And I, I think they've been mighty surprised, actually, by the sophistication of um, the legislation and the ideas that have come from community energy groups around the nation. This is, this is policy and legislation built by the people who know about it the best. Uh, it's people like you guys um, who know about this and have informed me. I'm really just the vehicle for trying to make it happen. But boy, I'm super committed to getting some action on this. Right, thank you, Helen. And I've got a question here. What would be the time frame for if you know for the bill and if it would, you know would be able to come into legislation? Yeah, okay. So these things do take time. Um, uh, at, as I said, it's gone now. It will go to committee. I'm waiting to hear when the committee will actually open their inquiry, but it's it's likely to be the middle of the year. Uh, then the, a process will take place that may take who knows, maybe six weeks or so, they will write a report. That report will say, uh, this is great legislation, government should do it. Or it may say, this is pretty good legislation, but we think there's a few problems with it. This is what would need to be fixed. Or they might say, this is rubbish, not interested at all. Um, of course, we want the first option. Um, the other component of this, of course, is that I'm pitching, irrespective of the legislation uh, coming into law is I'm pitching to the treasurer through the budget process. He could just get on and fund those 50 hubs around the nation, or he could fund some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reality of that, as I keep telling him, is the Victorian state government have done similar work with uh, community energy hubs, and many of you will be really aware of this. Uh, and there's been a 13-fold um, return on investment. This is really good economics. So, you know, the Treasurer could, in fact, say, well, let's throw Helen a bone and uh, let's fund a couple of these hubs just to kick it off. Uh, that sounds good, Helen. Sounds like um, a bit of work that we need to do in our sector as well to help support that work too. Yes, um, please. <laughs> just a couple other questions as well and a bit more about, um, a bit more specific. So in the bill and the legislation, is it, like is there things that get covered like different technologies like wave technology or looking at thermal energy exchange so um just assume that a bit more of the bill is actually a bit more how you know how does it define community energy and renewable energy at the moment okay so um it's not at all prescriptive about the type of renewable energy. It must be renewable energy. It can't be something like a gas-led recovery. Um, it, <laughs> it, you know, it, it can't be. Um, it can't be a nuclear power station. Although the, the the legislation doesn't specifically say that, but it's very specific that it's a renewable energy source. So um, it, it's not at all prescriptive in that in that respect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, again, just a bit of love as well, Helen, so in keeping up the, the good work that you're doing there at Canberra at the moment. Um, if we haven't got any more questions, we might be able to let you go now. And yeah, thank you so much. I know Parliament's sitting and it's a busy week and a bit of a crazy time up there at Canberra at the moment. So we thank love you so to much, Joy. And right. best wishes to, to you and to all the people on the call. And uh, thank you for the incredible work you're doing. You really do inspire me. And, uh, and I think you're inspiring the nation with those lived examples and great, uh, great activity on the ground. Thank you so much. Cheerio. Thank you, Helen. Well, following on to Helen, we've got Taryn. So Taryn Lane is the General Manager of Hepburn Wind, a Winston Churchill Fellow, and also a colleague of mine as a director on the Coalition of Community Energy Board. And Taryn will discuss the campaign at the moment for the Community Energy Target in Victoria and its ability to be replicated as well. So over to you, Taryn. Great, thank you so much, Donna. And um, Mari, is it okay if I just get you to share your screen and pull up a few slides? And firstly, I'd just like to say how lucky are we that we've, we have a champion uh, in the federal arena keeping community energy current and in the national narrative and in the conversations up there because it's been a long stint um, since we've, we've had that privilege. So I think you know the fact that there is now a parliamentary inquiry that's how all the, the, the big wins that, that I think the community energy sector in Victoria have occurred is through parliamentary inquiry processes. So it's really great that that can happen on a federal level now. Um, so I am just gonna refer particularly to highlights uh, in Victoria. So really just sort of, um, yeah, fo focus on that. So the current advocacy landscape in Victoria, and I guess the, you know, the things that have been either 
campaigned for in the past uh, and, and then delivered. We've seen a whole range of, of grant programs, so New Energy Jobs Fund uh, rounds one to five. We've had the Renewable Communities Program. We're now seeing the Neighbourhood Battery Grants. So, so really, I guess, timely and specific and curated grants programs coming out of um, the Victorian government, really responding to what our, our needs are um, on the grass, you know, on, on the ground level, on the grassroots level. Uh, the regional community power hub. So there was the pilot uh, phase at three sites um, between 2017 and 2020, and that's now had the green flag to expand across the, the state. Uh, and if there's interest in, um, you know, uh, sites of merit, then, then, yeah, each regional area will effectively have its own funded community power hub, which I think is going to be a real game changer um, and really fits in neatly with, with the advocacy that Helen's doing on a, on a national level. Um, lots of support of knowledge sharing as well out of the Victorian government. So they, they supported our Community Energy Congress back in uh, 2017. Uh, you know, there's been lots of, I guess, capacity building opportunities through, through the Community Power Hubs program. They've also uh, piloted the Zero Carbon Communities Program. So they did that with, with our project, um, Hepburn ZNet, and then expanded it to support more zero carbon communities in the Victorian space last year. We've seen two parliamentary inquiries. So the first one uh, was the parliamentary inquiry into community energy. And that was uh, held in 2016 and released in 2017. And then in 2019, we, we saw the parliamentary inquiry into communities tackling climate change. Uh, and then that was released in, in late 2020. And, you know, really all of these areas of, of benefit and, and, you know, policy settings and policy mechanisms are, are really replicable across the states and territories. And I think there's excellent data now out of the, the Victorian state government as to, uh, you know, the challenges of the programs, but also, you know, the success and, um, yeah, the good economic sense of these programs. Next slide. So, uh, a long-term campaign um, that, that we've been working on. And I think, you know, where we've had a lot of um, success across Victoria is, is really with the small and medium-sized um, asks, I guess. Uh, but, but some of the big asks, uh, like having a community energy target, uh, have, have yet to kind of come to fruition. So, so this is um, a concept that, that the, the Victorian community energy sector uh, has, you know, coordinated by C4CE has been campaigning on now for four years. So what we want to see is a community energy target uh, occur in Victoria and for that to be a carve out of the Victorian renewable energy target. So um, a, a portion of that would be allocated to community energy. And uh, we think that a, an appropriate portion would be 100 megawatts by 2025. And that this would be fixed on mid-scale projects. So as, as Helen was referring to, the, the big gap uh, both in the in the market and and you know what what's being built out, but also in regards to stimulus measures, is is that that gap that one to ten megawatt scale. So in Victoria, we're seeing you know household solar, business solar, farm solar be all well supported. We're seeing large scale projects be able to uh, apply for uh, you know more secure long term income. Uh, through the, the VRED auction schemes. And so what we're asking for is, is a carve out for that mid-scale for communities to get on and, and build projects, you know, of the size or equivalent of Hepburn Wind. There's a very good reason why there aren't many more Hepburn Winds around the state, um, you know, whether they're solar or, or wind or uh, any other technology. Um, and, and that's because of the risk profile and, and the lack of security around, around that scale. So having a feed-in tariff or a similar mechanism would be the pathway to do it. That there's around about three uh, mechanisms that, that the government could deploy. And we were very pleased to see it recently recommended in the parliamentary inquiries that was released uh, in December last year. So it's the first time that we've got, uh, you know, that, that narrative and that need um, into that, that got government documentation. Um, and as you can see from all the logos on the right, it's a, it's a real collaboration um, across the state. So I, I think it's also a, a very good um, example for, for other states uh, and can fit in neatly um, with, with their context as well. Next slide. 
So some additional replicable advocacy ideas uh, for, for state and local government would be uh, around the zero carbon communities program idea. So, you know, one way they could approach it is to, to really target five leading communities each year and then just keep building that year on year so that you're, you're bringing, uh, you know, you're sort of broadening out, I guess, the ambition of, of more and more communities over the year. Uh, another one would be for the state government to, to really authorise a mandate for local governments to work with their communities to deliver zero net emission uh, action plans and, and to set science-based science targets. Um, that combination of community and council action together is what can really make action happen fast. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really critical to, to particularly in, in, in communities where uh, there, there isn't that, that local government leadership and support happening to really try and activate it. Um, what you can ask your local governments to do is to, to work with you, um, particularly just to set zero carbon targets and strategies, provide backbone support for, for your activities, whether they're community energy projects or, you know, uh, associated projects like energy efficiency projects, transport projects, anything that's, that's uh, related to reducing emissions. Uh, next slide. And why it's important um, is because, you know, we've got all the, the, the yellow orange flags on the map there are all the community energy groups around Australia. So we're everywhere and um, every year we're growing. So I think we're at, at about 105 at the moment. Um, and likewise, you know, in all of those states, they've got uh, renewable energy targets and most of them have got, um, you know, zero net emissions targets. Uh, they don't have emission reduction targets yet. And so what, what will help that is if lots and lots and lots of communities, you know, like mine, uh, set ambitious targets for how to reach zero net emissions so that we can really help our, you know, local governments, help our state governments be more ambitious in these emission reduction targets and, and the broader targets. Um, yeah, I might leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. And just a reminder, people, put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get back to us all a little bit later as well. So keep on popping those questions in there and hopefully the chat functionality is working now, but let's see how we go. All right, our next speaker is Christy. So Christy Walters is the Community Engagement Manager at the Community Power Agency. Christy has also worked for Renewable Energy and Climate Change campaigns for um, Friends of the Earth and also Solar Citizens as well. And she's going to give us an overview of the Repower Our Communities campaign. So over to you, Christy. Excellent. Thanks, Donna. I'll just set my sharing screen up. Perfect. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm on the lands of the Turrbal and Jagera people um, up in Brisbane at the moment. Usually I'm in, on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. So it's, it's a privilege to be in a new place. Um, so what I wanted to, to chat to everyone today about is the Repower Our Communities campaign. And so this, this campaign is really um, it's come out of the whole um, co-design process that Helen Haynes ran um, last year. Um, a lot of us on the call and myself included were involved in, in that in, um, design process. Um, and from our perspective, we went, this is a great opportunity. We've been campaigning for national level support for community energy for several years now. Um, a lot of our policy ideas are actually encapsulated in the local power plan. So it's really great to see that being taken up um, by a federal MP. Um, and but what we really wanted to do was to ensure that it has the best chance possible to actually get legislated. So that's why um, we've partnered with Farmers for Climate Action who um, are really excited about how renewables can benefit regional communities um, and in particular farming communities right across the country. Um, and so we've, we've set up this campaign and it's really just in its very beginning stages. Um, we actually had a few farmers and community energy representatives go to Parliament House um, last month to watch Helen table the bill. Um, and we did a little bit of media to explain, um, yeah, what, why we support the, um, the local power plan and, and what we wanna see happen um, in this space. So it's, 
I guess an um, an opportunity for community energy groups to to kind of to get on board this as a as the grassroots campaign to get um, national community energy kind of funding and support happening. Um, so um, the the key reasons for this, I'm sure I don't have to tell everyone on the call now of why community energy is important, but I think it's it's really helpful to to all be talking the same language so that when we are talking to people in our communities, whether they be MPs or, you know, your neighbor who's never heard of community energy, it's useful if we're all saying the same thing. So then the message is kind of amplified nationwide. Um, and so for us at, at Community Power Agency, our, our mission is really to drive a faster and fairer transition towards clean energy and really community energy kind of meets both the faster and the fairer um, through these we like to call them the four Ds. So obviously um, community energy helps to decarbonize our um, electricity system through using renewable energy. Um, and the second one, um, decentralize, uh, is really important to, to have a, a really resilient electricity system. Because if we can have lots of smaller um, power generating assets, and that can also just be rooftop solar on people's houses, but spread right across our country, then there's less dependence on single large energy generators. Um, and as we've seen in, in past summers when it's been really hot, some of those um, coal infrastructures actually fail and then there's a bigger problem. So if we can have more decentralized uh, renewable energy happening across the country, then we're in a much better position. The third one, democratize, um, is really important to me um, and, and as I know lots of community energy groups um, have been set up to literally take back the power into their own hands so that there's more they have more of a say and more control over how power is um, uh, you know is, is used and distributed within their communities so this really comes into play with um, the way community energy projects are set up um, as you as you would know probably from lots of your own experience, um, community energy groups really prioritize um, being inclusive and, and um, educating people within the community on to like what they're doing and as a community and what you can do even in your own home. So a lot of groups I know are really um, doing a lot of work in um, energy literacy and energy efficiency. So educating um, people about how they can get involved in their own projects, but also um, what they can do at an individual level as well. So it's it's really important on that on that scale too. And the fourth one is probably the most important um, in terms of getting the message across about how and why we should repower our communities is demonstrating what community energy is and 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 how everyone can really benefit from from renewable energy. And it's really giving people the sort of lived experience of like especially in Hepburn, there's been a huge uptake in acceptance levels of, of wind power in general because people can see it and they can feel it and they can hear it. And, you know, it gives them that experience of, oh, maybe I didn't know what a, what a wind farm would be like beforehand and now I know. And, I, and people go in, you know, the, I forget what the name is, where there's like a community fun run around the, the wind turbine. So doing all these kinds of activities is really important to involve people in, in what community energy um, looks and feels like. And so I guess the, the key thing that I wanted to talk about um, today um, is why is there an opportunity now? And it's really, um, I'm really glad that uh, Helen was on the call um, to explain uh, what the local power plan is and the associated bill, um, an agency that they're seeking to set up. Um, that's like the key opportunity, but but more so than that, um, we know that there's going to be a federal election coming up, um, potentially this year, or, or maybe it could be next year. Um, and as we've seen, you know, countries around the world, most notably the United States, are, are making much bigger steps towards doing significant things for climate action. Uh, and Australia really lags behind on that front. Um, and what community energy represents is, is kind of the, the sweet spot for, for coalition um, politicians in that it is taking action on climate, it is making a change, but it's doing it in a way that's really tangible for local communities. Um, these kinds of projects um, 
enable so much more uh, regional economic development. There's the local jobs that are created. Um, and in the case that, that Helen mentioned, there's lots of communities where they want these projects and they want to be able to be involved and design them um, from a community resilience perspective of, of being affected by bushfires or, or other um, climate events or wild weather events that are, are threatening their power supply. Um, and so having projects that where, whether it be a microgrid or a, a community owned battery that can enable them to, to have the energy when they most need it um, in times of um, extreme weather events that they are gonna need to um, use that. Um, and so what we're doing with this campaign is um, next week we'll be having a, uh, a webinar that will go through in a bit more detail the, the strategy of the whole Repower Our Communities campaign um, and really how people can get involved um, to, to help kind of spread the word at a national scale um, and to, to really let our politicians know that you know, this is gonna be the game changer for lots of community energy groups. Um, we know that state governments are doing, um, especially in Victoria, a lot of great things for community energy, um, but really the, the federal government has a wonderful opportunity to, to really step up and, and make these kinds of things happen. Um, so there's, I'll put the link in the, um, um, in the Q and A so folks can head over there if you would like to register. Um, but I might just leave it there and have plenty of time for questions. Thank you, Christy. That's fantastic. And um, yes, you can join the webinar next week to get a bit more detail about that as well. But we'll probably flesh it out a little bit more in our Q&A session too. So, so our final presenter is Andrew Bray. So Andrew is the National Director of Realliance, formerly known as the Australian Wind Alliance. Um, he's based in New South Wales in one of the prime wind districts in the Southern Tablelands. And Andrew will discuss the community energy opportunities, especially in renewable energy zones. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Donna. Um, so what I'd, um, and yes, and hello to everyone on the call and um, hello to my fellow speakers. It's been a very entertaining webinar so far. <clears throat> um, what I'd like to um, uh, do is sort of talk, talk about a slightly different um, aspect of this discussion. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and talk about the community benefits out of the renewable energy boom. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so the, uh, Helen mentioned earlier on the, the renewable energy zones uh, and, and gave a map of, of those ones that are around the country. Uh, and talked about a lot of the opportunities that are in those uh, reses um, and lots of, and there really are lots of opportunities for local communities out of them. Um, but one of the things that perhaps wasn't that she didn't, you know, front end so much uh, was that actually the renewable energy zones on the ground, when you look at them from communities who perhaps aren't terribly engaged in the whole energy thing, um, will look like a whole lot of new infrastructure coming and um, landing in their community. So it might be a new transmission line, uh, it might be a whole lot of new solar farms, uh, it might be wind farms, you know, even pumped hydro um, that'll start to change the way that their um, uh, change the way that their their water flows around there. So there's a lot of local issues that are going to arise out of res development. Um, so it's important that uh, the opportunities that reses deliver for local communities are very real ones and they're quite tangible. Um, so I guess I'm, I, I'm sort of, I hope I can sort of uh, fill in fill in an extra part of the of this discussion because there's been uh, both Christy and, and Taryn gave up some, and Helen, of course, gave a lot of good ideas about advocacy ideas to government around and some of the programs that you can kind of uh, get up. Um, but I think there's, there's an advocacy job to be done on the ground as well with local communities. And, um, and I'm sure there'll be some people here on the call who are um, living in some of these renewable energy zones. So uh, part of the advocacy role, I think uh, for us, particularly the ones in the regions, um, 
are to be explaining these kind of opportunities and to be um, making community ownership possibilities um, more tangible and more uh, accessible for people. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the term around it is really one of social license. How can we build social license in the renewable energy zones and how can um, community ownership and the possibility that local people can uh, can share in uh, share in this in this development uh, is kind of the key here. Um, so the way we sort of normally think about it when we go in and, and speak in um, wind regions, and, and of course most of the work we've done to date has been into in the regions with where the wind farms are, but. Um, uh, but increasingly we're going into solar solar places as well, um, is the idea of community benefit sharing. And um, and so there's a kind of spectrum here, really. Um, one is simply how renewable projects, um, you know, give funds to the community for things like, you know, school community gardens and that kind of thing. They're the community enhancement funds um, and grants uh, essentially made from the project um, and then administered by the community and, and handed out to you know really useful projects in the area. Uh, and then from there, once you get into the sort of ownership spectrum, um, community investment is an option that um, uh, that is sometimes used, and we've seen that in some some wind farms. Uh, and this this really is where you have community ownership but in the context of large scale renewables. So, so the Sapphire wind farm, which is a really, you know, it's a, it's a large wind farm indeed, it's 270 megawatts um, up in the New England. Uh, it offered a, a certain amount of its um, capital um, to, to local investors. Um, and essentially people can invest in it and it, it provides a guaranteed return. So it's still, it's still a large scale project built by a private company, um, but it does allow local people to get um, the fixed return out of it. And, you know, it's, it's a great way of sort of um, engaging with the community as well. Um, the other examples there are, um, there's a company called WindLab. They have a couple of projects in Victoria, Kanua Bridge and uh, Kayata, which are both sort of Western Victoria. Um, and for those ones, they've actually um, gifted part of the, the project to local landowners and neighbours and allowed them to, to buy extra into it. Um, and so in that instance, there's also a sense that the community is invested in the project. Um, they understand it and are involved in it. Um, but not, neither of those ones you would really describe as co-ownership. They're more community investment. Um, and, and once you go into co-ownership or full community community ownership like um, like Hepburn Wind, you're talking about quite a different different sort of structure. And certainly in the wind wind farm space, because they're more complicated and more expensive projects, uh, that's been a difficult one for community energy to sort of um, break into, I guess. Um, one other aspect or one other example I might mention there is that the ACT government in their second auction, second round auction. Um, awarded one of their projects to NEON and as part of that auction they um, they'll be building a 50 megawatt battery in Canberra which will be available for community investment for people in the Canberra region. Um, so that's uh, community in, um, investment in a battery so you know lots of lots of new spaces here. Um, and the one thing I mentioned before I jump off this slide is that um, Re renewable energy zones where you have a bunch of projects all in the one area uh, allow you to sort of bring those community benefits together. Uh, and whereas projects would have their individual community funds, uh, there's, there's a possibility now for um, those funds to join together and more efficiently, um, you know, deliver benefits to local communities. Uh, and I'm just going to um, end off with a sort of um, a kind of new idea really and one is that and this is one that um, <clears throat> again it's a sort of intersection between social license challenges and community opportunities um, until now we've really thought of transmission lines as being something that the government builds you know they haven't haven't really built large ones for 30 or 40 years 
Um, they've never really been in the business of, of sharing benefits or anything like that. The government builds it. If you're on the line, well, you know, they'll come in and buy some of your land and, and off you'll go and you'll be living with this thing for a while. Um, transmission companies uh, probably have the biggest social license challenges of any of the operators in the renewable energy zones. Um, you know, wind turbines are beautiful. Everyone loves solar. But who wants to live, look at a transmission line? Um, so they really are thinking through ways in which they can be um, uh, engaging on this benefit sharing journey. And certainly one thing um, that I know they're thinking about um, is the idea that, you know, could there be community investment in a transmission line? If you can do it in a battery project, why couldn't you do it in a transmission line? Um, so I think in thinking about what sort of things you, you're going to advocate for, um, some of that advo um, advocacy could be directed not, not just towards the government, but even the transmission companies themselves. It's quite a big opportunity there. They're quite large scale uh, projects uh, and they really need to be able to demonstrate to local people that there's a benefit for having the transmission line there. So. So that's one um, one sort of you know thing I thought I'd throw in there, but um, I'd be interested. I'm really looking forward to the discussion, and I'm really pleased that um, that so much time's been given over to the discussion. So um, yeah, very happy to answer any questions and hear any ideas. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. And we're just going to move, and I'll get all the presenters to take off their come back on the video. And I think we might even try and do a poll, actually, while we're just starting to get set up. We actually we're going to put a poll up to see where everyone is, like around the country and from what state you are in. So hopefully that's happened to the amazing power of Zoom. Oh, look, it's just there in front of me. There we are. So you can actually put in where you are. It will just help us, guide us if, on the discussion about where people are at and how we should be targeting some of these questions as well. But before we get into a couple there, I just want to, and it's up in Taryn and Christy, you both referred on, why is right now really important on advocacy on community energy? So why is it, there's a lot of momentum and why are things happening right this minute with community energy? So I don't know, Taryn, if you want to go first and that seems that you still have referred to how yeah, it's been happening, building for a few years, but it feels like it's all really come together at the moment. Yeah, look, I think, um... It, it has been building for a long time, particularly in, in areas uh, such as Victoria and New South Wales. But I think we're starting to see a bit of a culmination of, of new factors over the past you know, 18 months. So I think the first piece was the bushfires. And that really start, started to push the relevance of uh, you know, community energy in regards to, to local resilience, um, bushfire resilience and, you know, the, the impacts that the, the communities um, had around loss of electricity and, and the ongoing threat that they have around that. Uh, and so, you know, community energy all of a sudden starts to make sense in, in, a, in, a, different, in, a, in a different idea. Uh, and then, you know, the pandemic hit and, and I, I really thought that we were going to see, a, a, you know, a massive scaling back of, of community energy initiatives because of the, the pandemic. But instead, what we saw was, was, you know, particularly in Victoria, a really big focus on it as, as a solution and a, and a pathway to getting communities more engaged. Um, and then, you know, drawing on what Andrew has been talking about, about the reses, you know, I think we are up for some pretty big uh, social license barriers in regards to the reses and the forthcoming transmission lines and uh, there is also a need to fill up the mids, you know the, the distribution and low voltage network as much as possible because we could see some some delays with um, these projects uh, you know and and not meet the timelines that we need to meet to transition in time so I think there, there's quite a lot of factors drawing it together right now um, and you know most importantly particularly in Victoria we've got a really engaged um, and sympathetic uh, state government who, who really gets community energy and has invested in programs and now has the data to show how meaningful um, those programs are on an environmental, social and, and economic level. So we've got the data to prove that it works. And, you know, Helen's been really building on, on that. And, you know, there's also a lot happening in, in the New South Wales space. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Taryn. And Christy, like, you know, the Repower Our Communities campaigns be a bit more targeting at the federal government. Can you see that, you know, a bit more energy there as well? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I'd probably echo a lot of what um, Taryn has said around the bushfires um, and the pandemic, really showing people that, you know, they want to take action both on climate and for community resilience and they want to do it now. And the good thing about lots of community energy projects is there's so many different types, you know, from like on the big end of town, the wind farms like um, Hepburn, although they're a little difficult, um, right down to the, the smaller end where, you know, doing solar bulk buys for your local town. Um, and all of those things play a huge part in helping the like broader Australian community to transition to 100% renewable energy. And I think the, um, the, the state governments are increasingly recognizing, um, you know, as, as Andy kind of referenced that social license is going to play a huge part in actually making all of these plans a reality. Um, I think it's almost every state has renewable energy zones um, and is needing to um, upgrade their transmission lines or inter interconnectors. And so funding community energy is a great way to um, involve local people in projects that they can actually have a say on. And, and through, through doing a solar block buy or like maybe a, a one megawatt solar farm or you know anything in between, even just an education program around electricity, really enables people to understand what's happening um, to our electricity system and, and how they can get involved. So when the transmission project does come to town, it's not a like, oh no, those are ugly, I don't want them. It's more like, oh, I think that's needed for the transition and probably would help my project to, to get online. Maybe I'll go to them and say, oh yeah, mm. this sounds okay, but like what's in it for my community? And so there's, it's opening up the discussion of what's possible rather than just shutting it down from the get-go. So I think that's really important. And I think at the, the federal level, um, you know, we've seen there hasn't been a whole lot of, um, well, it's the word political will for, um, you know, a renewable energy target or any climate policy or, or anything that's like large scale and sweeping of the kind that we really need. Um, and so community energy can really hit the sweet spot of, of tapping into, um, you know, an, an economic narrative of um, providing local jobs and, and regional economic development, especially after, you know, a pandemic has pretty much decimated the tourism industry and, and lots of other industries. Funding these kinds of projects can really help revitalize those communities, both through um, actually funding projects to happen. And, and we know when communities are involved in the design and the de development of projects, so many more locals are involved in actually the delivery of it. So it's, that's how it creates um, more local jobs. Um, and so, yeah, there's, it's, I think, just a, an excellent opportunity for, um, well, any MP of any political persuasion, really, to support these kinds of initiatives to show that, yes, we care about regional Australia. Yes, we care about community resilience. And oh, if it has a climate benefit, then that's great too, but maybe that's not their focus. So, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. Thanks, Christy. And Andrew, I think it's really interesting your presentation and it's come up in a bit of the Q&A as well, is that, um, you know, and usually when we think community energy, we think of the, you know, the blind, the solar or the wind turbines, but it's actually, there's all those other components that we need to look at when we're looking at this transition um, to the renewable energy and also a just transition as well. So the social license on other components, as you said, like they actually infrastructure or um, as Dennis has talked about, you know, of um, virtual power plants and some of the distributed energy and some of those other solutions that are a piece of the puzzle. So there's actually a role of community energy to do in, in working on some of that work as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely correct. <clears throat> um, I mean, the, the first point to make is probably that um, it's really the the community engagement around any of these processes any of these projects is really the key and and the way in which whether it's a solar farm a battery a transmission line um, a wind farm they they all need to be having conversations with their local their local communities uh, and they need to be taking a, taking on board their concerns as early as possible and addressing them as, as much as possible um, and the <clears throat> the community ownership or benefit sharing conversation needs to be part of that wider community engagement pro, um, discussion. 
So it's it's really it's it's another way for the developer or um, to come to the community and say, well, here's an offer that we can make that's going to be something that you might want. How do you want to see it? What's going to work for you? Um, if it's a community ownership one, um, I know that Taryn was involved in quite a long process around the Sapphire Wind Farm of talking to the community around there. Um, how do you want to be able to invest in this? How much do you want to be able to invest in it? What kind of conditions do you want? Um, it's, it's, quite a, it, it's quite a long conversation, but it's an important one for the community to feel like the developer is a partner with them rather than just someone who's going to come and dump their, their infrastructure on you. So um, right. it's quite, quite important that way. Yeah, so you don't get the like the picture you were showing of the um, SP Osnet, I think, is that's a farmer who had um, mowed that into his field. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's not, the, not the reaction we really want, is it? Got a question here from Alana. Um, she would like to he hear what the top lessons on advocating these kinds of projects to state governments and government departments. So what's what's some of the tips and you know what's the reason why we think we have got to be a momentum at the moment and some of the top lessons from that? Do you want me to answer that in the Victorian context? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I think we have been highly engaged in every possible way that we can make a submission, uh, you know, have a meeting, bring politicians out to, to the wind farm. Uh, and we've been really clear, I think, as a, as a broad sector across Victoria in, in what the gaps are, what the learnings are and what our needs are and, and putting forward um, that information. And I think what the Victorian government has has done in response to that is that they've really piloted things. So, you know, things like the community power hubs, for example, or the zero carbon communities, they've piloted them to get the data to find out the impact and if they work. And likewise with, with the grants, with New Energy Jobs Fund, um, you know, they, they've gone, okay, let, let's give this a go once, but have a broad strategy to, to think about community energy over a number of years. And then they've improved um, that, you know, and, and had multiple iterations uh, and, and expansions of that. So, you know, we've been very lucky that they haven't just piloted and forgotten about it, they've piloted and then scaled up, um, which I think is part of that success. And, you know, in, in regards to areas where there might not be that much engagement, I think, you know, requesting parliamentary inquiries is a really good pathway to, to getting the government to, uh, you know, on a bipartisan level, come together and, and explore the topic of, of community energy or, you know, communities tackling climate change. So I think it's a really good pathway in to, to that deep engagement. Thanks, Taryn. Can I add a little bit? Yeah. Go, Christy. Uh, one thing that I would say um, in, in chatting with whether it's politicians or um, state departments or, you know, anyone really is, is figuring out, um, you know, what's the, everyone ha is in some part motivated by self-interest. So what's in it for the MP or what's in it for the department? You know, how do you make, how do you achieve something that they want to see happen um, and really demonstrating that. So um, for a lot of um, MPs that, I was involved a little bit in the Victorian work um, and I know a lot of the MPs were really motivated to actually do something about climate change and so showing how it would um, have an impact on that was was key um, but for others it might be I want to ensure that there's going to be um, you know more jobs in a certain area and so wherever we can I think it's really important to to demonstrate and to show so the you know, Taryn's example of, of taking MPs out to a wind farm to show them like this is what it what it looks like and, you know, having people there who are involved in it and, and they can speak just from their experience of how, how it's been to be involved in the Hepburn Wind project. Um, so, yeah, using case studies as much as possible, I think, is, is a really helpful thing. Andrew, you got anything to add? What's been some of the, the tactics that you feel like it's been working for some of the advocacy work you've been working on? Um, oh, look, to be honest, we, we haven't done as much in the sort of advocating directly to government space as um, either Christy or Taryn have. Um, we've sort of, our role has been as much about advocating to the industry and then getting them um, 
teed up to deliver this sort of thing. Um, so for instance, the, the idea that a, all large scale projects in a res should um, offer 20% for community investment. Um, there's not that many companies in the industry. In fact, I fielded a call to this effect last week um, saying, oh, look, we're, we're thinking of doing this for a solar farm. How do you do it? Who do I talk to? <laughs> like, there's really not much, much knowledge um, around how to do this. Um, and like, it's, it's obviously critical for the government frameworks to be there. Um, and so that's why, you know, things like the local power plan are so important, like the Repower Our Communities campaign is so important. Um, but at the same time, if the, the, the industry can be quite proactive in doing, um, offering solutions in this front, and, um, and a lot of them are thinking quite creatively. Um, so, and this is probably something that's more open to local, you know, people who are in the renewable energy zones and perhaps having discussions with developers in those areas. Um, you're saying to them, well, if you want to come on this land, you know, um, look after the neighbours, you know, look, think, think about offering community ownership and doing those kind of things. Andrew, and that's like a bit funny, a question we got from Tony. So saying if a company wanted to open up their large renewable project for co-investment, where should they turn first? Are there any legal governance structures, templates to grab and copy? Um, <clears throat> I see you're taking yourself off mute there, Taryn. I'm just about to say, go to Taryn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think both. The best resource in the space, um, which uh, we released in at the end of 2019, is the Clean Energy Council's Guide to Benefit Sharing, and it has a chapter on um, on innovative financing, and it's all about community co-investment uh, for large-scale renewables, and it's got a deep dive into the the Sapphire case study and um, all the attributes of that project, and then what some other kind of models and options would be. Uh, and then there's also on the C4CE Knowledge Hub, uh, there is some, some guides and toolkits uh, that are around small scale solar and some of that stuff is, is still very relevant and useful for, for large scale projects to, to understand the, the space a bit more. Cool. Thanks, Taryn. Got a question here from Dennis. Um, the Bushfire Recovery Victoria has a grant writing team to assist communities. This should be the case with government grant application bodies to assist community groups who volunteer, challenge and lack expertise. Helen's Haynes hubs would be overcome some of these issues as well. I think this is something that's really in knowledge across the sector and, and why the community energy hubs are really important. I don't know, Christy, if you want to talk a little bit like, you know, some of the advocacy work that you're going to be doing on pushing for some more of those hubs, you know, take the example of Victoria to take it a bit nationally as well. Yeah, I mean, um, definitely that's something that um, I would see as being really crucial for the, um, in the local power plan, Helen Hen calls them local power hubs. Um, the ones in practice are called community power hubs. They're very similar concepts, although um, can be delivered slightly differently. Um, one of the things that, that we're going to be doing in the Repower Our Communities campaign is, um, is in asking community energy groups to, to be involved, um, you know, as you were in the, the co-design process to figuring out the local power plan. Um, when we are um, meeting with various MPs, you know, it's, it's always very handy to say, and from my perspective, this is what would be helpful in, in our region. Um, so that all of those ideas can be um, captured. Um, but I'm sure Taryn can um, add a little, more, little bit more flavour from the Victorian experience of the community power hubs that have already happened. Um, thanks. I can see there's a question actually just asking about from Luke, which is just asking, yeah, about some of, some of the, the learnings and, and what the expansion looks like in Victoria. And so my understanding is that uh, so the three original hubs uh, really had more of a, I guess, a, a, an immediate location kind of focus. So Bendigo, Ballarat, and then the Latrobe Valley, uh, because, you know, they had a small amount of resourcing and they, they were getting starts, you know, starting up and, and they did a, a really fantastic job. But the, I guess the implementation of the expansion is expecting uh, the hubs, which will be in six Grampian locations to be regionally focused and to treat each local government area in an equitable fashion. 
So they're really, you know, expecting it not to be, I guess, regional centre focus, that, that it, it is broader than that. Uh, and there'll be a lot more money in the kitty for those groups. So, um, you know, the, the, the funding, I think, was around about uh, 200,000 for, for the last round. And I think it's 428,000 for the first year um, from the expansion. And if there's less hubs, there'll be more money, but that, that's a minimum threshold amount. So that, that will really enable um, those groups to, to do a lot of, yeah, get a lot of projects in the pipeline, essentially, which, which is what it's all about. And just touching back on the, the bushfire comment around um, grant writing, like I think that was one of the biggest outcomes from, from the hubs was their ability to support community, to connect community groups with either subsidies that are existing, uh, you know, for things like farms, uh, you know, solar on farms and, 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 you know, solar on households, as well as writing grants for, for like, you know, Ballarat did a great grant for the Ararat Hospital, um, for, for, a, for a morgue, uh, and just getting those businesses, um, you know, enabled to, to, to have their sites be, be renewable. So, so there is a really big role um, for that 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 connectivity to happen um, across all, all technologies as well as sort of community ownership models. Thanks, Taryn. Got a question here from Michael. Um, with the focus having moved to zero net emissions, there is a shift to wider areas of achieving in the community, things like rege regenerative agriculture, waste to bioenergy, energy efficiency, as well as all the focus needing to be addressed on renewable energy. Um, so saying renewable energy itself in traditional ways may not be the best way of achieving a Z in some communities. Should there be a refocus of what, you know, community groups should be doing? Do you want me to have a, have a go at this again? <laughs> um, so, I mean, look, I, I as the map that, that was put up at the, as my last slide, you know, shows, there's there's all these community energy groups, there's all this work on community energy and, and zero net emission that needs to happen. And I, I think that community energy groups are really perfectly placed alongside local uh, sustainability groups, local climate action groups, their local councils to really lead on zero net emissions uh, works. Um, and that's certainly what, what our focus is on in the Hepburn Shire and, and Mick, what's going on in, in the Mad Alexander Shire as well is, is really a broadening out of, of and, and when you take a look at the data, you realise that actually the energy piece, um, particularly in regional areas, is, is often the simplest and not necessarily the biggest piece of the pie to tackle. And, you know, there are trickier areas like agriculture and transport um, that, that we really need to, to start to address. And, and even if that's just building literacy uh, around these other areas so that we, you know, and, and, and enabling our, our community members to take these opportunities when they come up. Like we, we've just published a, uh, a guide on how local farms can reach zero net emissions that we'll be launching soon because it's really important for us to, you know, start to engage and support our agriculture sector to also um, transition alongside us. The other thing that I would add is, um, I guess, sort of inherent in the, the concept of community energy is that it's the community that's defining, you know, what is needed. So the, the people that are involved at a local level will be able to say, okay, we've, we've got solar on all our houses, we've got a, um, a wind farm that's powering our larger, um, gener uh, larger energy users, um, you know, what's next? And um, it's gonna be different for every community. Like as Taryn said, some will be have more agricultural things happening, but I think that's that's the the key really to to um, having programs that are about capacity building and funding locals to decide what it is that they need to to get happening, and and that's really the key piece in in both the local power plan that Helen's suggesting and will be the, the central piece in the to repower our communities. It's you know. It's our communities. We know what needs to happen. We just need support to make it happen. Christy and Andrew, well, you sort of changed your direction of your organisation to compass a bit more of a holistic approach to renewable energy zones and what's happening, especially in regional communities. Yeah, well, what, what Christy was just mentioning there made me think of the, the work we're doing in uh, Moyne Shire, which is in southwest Victoria. Um, and the the process there, there's a like the, essentially that part of the world is already a renewable energy zone, 
and it's sort of just grown up that way because it's already it's got, got a lot of grid capacity it's got great wind so there's been a lot of wind farms go in but there's a hell of a lot more sheep than there are people in Moyne and um and a lot of the wind farms are sort of clustered around particular towns there so um so what we've what we've tried to do there is get get some of those wind farms and their funds coordinated into the one um the one sort of funding vehicle but the 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 critical part of it and it's and it's still in development so um you know it's a great idea and I'll, I'll explain what a great idea it is but i can't tell you it's got great results yet but the um what the framework we'll be using is one that the bendigo bank used through their community enterprise foundation and they they roll this out in things like there's a Malakuta bushfire recovery fund and, and a number of other funds they run. Um, and the critical part of it is, is they have a strategic planning process that they do with the community. So they get in, interested community people together, say what's the important stuff in this community for the next year, for the next three years, for the next five years, how do we work, to, how do we work together? And here the, the opportunity is that the res projects bring the funds and the community then gets to say right things we think are important that perhaps the council's not doing or whatever are these ones so again exactly what you say christy the the key there is to empower the local people to decide what's what's the best thing for their area thanks andrew it's a great example but a question here from Jan. Um, would be interested here what leverage you see communities as having in negotiations with developers. Outside of legislation, what would prompt developers to make considerations for community energy, especially in terms of co-ownership agreements? So I can take this one. Um, uh, well, it sort of depends on who you talk about with the communities. Um, so any developer has to, <clears throat> if, if they're a fair income developer and they're not just a, you know, sort of cowboy bunch, you know, just sort of out there signing up things and flipping them over to, to a big developer. If they're a genuine developer, what they'll want to do is, is create that relationship with the local community and get that support. And there is some basic stuff they need to do. So if you're a farmer um, and someone wants to put something on your land, you've got to sign an agreement to say you're happy for that to happen. So there's quite a lot of, um, there's quite a lot of uh, leverage there that you've got and influence. Um, but more importantly, I mean, this is what kind of what the planning process is about. Uh, and unfortunately it's a, it's a kind of, it's often an adversary, it plays out adversarially and you get people just digging in on one side, not necessarily to oppose the project because they've often got a good sense that the project's gonna go ahead anyway, but to get the best outcome for it. But to do that, they have to, you know, pretend like it's gonna bring the world down if it gets built. So, um, so I would encourage communities not, not to go down that adversarial line, but actually, um, you know, try to engage with the, the developer in the same way that Christy described with governments before, you know, a government department. What, what, does, what does a developer want out of this? Mostly, you know, they're going to want to know, they're going to want to say, we have the support of our local people, that's good for them to get their planning permits, good for them to, for their, um, their, you know, their view, um, what's the word, the, the optics of it. Um, all those things are important. So communities do have quite a bit of say in it, um, but often you just need to find your way in and find the right person to say it to. Mm -hmm. and I'll just add one thing there is that um, I think the, the wind industry, and Andy would know this better than me, but they've really learnt from um, past bad experiences that if, if they don't engage communities appropriately, then they can kick up a stink and projects might not go ahead. So there's a, a huge incentive for um, large scale developers to, to get it right. Um, and a, a big part of that is in their, um, when they're seeking um, investments to actually fund the project, like savvy investors will look out for um, any community opposition. And so they might do a media scan or 
they'll see um, whether there's been any opposition lodged at the DA level. Um, and so it's, you know, for, for companies that are like, you know, not cowboy operators, the ones that are, are worth their salt will, um, will seek to, to involve community. And I guess to the extent of, of how much community can be involved versus um, just informed is sort of like a spectrum. And, you know, I, I think that's um, a lot of the work that Andy is doing to, to really up that level of engagement. Um, and increasingly, um, it's not just investors, but also the power purchases. So mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of companies now are buying their power from you know this solar farm or that wind farm, um, and they often are, are quite they're quite tuned into the optics as well. So they will do all those searches Christy's talking about. Yeah, and a lot of them got their own targets as well, so they need to make sure that they're reaching so too. Um, good. It's, it's so sort of good comment, but I thought actually panelists might want to have discuss it a bit further from Tom. Um, planning phase at the state level. Community ownership is often completed in months. Corporate ownership usually takes several years. Is is that everyone's experience? I would I would say it depends what the like what level of involvement. Um, I'm, I'm involved in a, a community um, developer partnership at the moment in the Haystack Solar Garden project that's it's going to be built in the Riverina of New South Wales, but anyone in New South Wales can sign up to become a, a solar gardener and um, it's kind of like purchasing an offsite um, plot of, of solar. Um, and that's been going for more than a year of the kind of community engagement to, you know, how do we want this project to work, to here's the options, what do you think? Um, it's set up as a cooperative. So um, anyone that becomes a member can be involved in those discussions. So there's definitely longer processes and I'm sure Taryn can explain how, how long the process was for Hepburn Wind, but there, there's also, um, you know, it's kind of, there's sort of a spectrum of community engagement to like informing that we are doing this project and FYI to write down the other end and like you can really be um, involved in um, and engaged in having a say on like where the wind turbine goes or how what the community benefit scheme looks like so there's there's lots of room you know for how that process goes it's not really a always going to be done in three months or a situation cool. yeah Thanks, and I, I I sort of think you know I, I think one of the issues which will be probably a future issue that the sector should try and, and negotiate and, and deal with is the fact that mid-scale projects, you know, mid-scale community energy projects are exposed to basically the same development process as a large-scale project and the same cost profile. Um, if you've got good relationships and, you know, people are feeling kind and they've got a good, uh, you know, good steady income in their business, they, they will provide discounts or pro bono kind of support, which can really, you know, reduce your, your costs. But uh, all of that's a negotiation. And, and what, what's happened in countries internationally is that a, a different methodology has been applied to mid-scale community energy projects to really like simplify and streamline the process um, because of the cost savings, but, but also, um, you know, in some ways it's just sort of over, over spec. So I think um, that's definitely where there's some room to, to improve uh, in, in the future. And, and that, you know, the development timeline, the development costs, all of that, that holds up, um, a, you know, the, the project as well. Thanks, Taryn. A question here, and see if our panelists can help with this one, um, from John, talking about the South Australian context, saying South Australia is constrained by the terms and conditions of the SA Power Network's privatisation. What is the best way forward for community energy within the limits imposed by this? Not quite sure if people have been doing work, but this is when we need our colleague Heather from the Coalition mm. of Community Energy as well. So, John, we might have to take that one on notice if anyone's got a response for that one. Um, I can um, add a few comments. Um, I mean, I think it, it sort of depends on uh, what scale of community energy you're talking about. So if it is a like a mid-scale sort of um, one megawatt solar farm that is not seeking to be um, connected to the... Um, well, for one megawatt, it would probably be the, the, the low voltage distribution network. 
um, yeah, that that might be an issue. I'm not not really familiar with how South Australia works. I imagine it'd be similar to to Queensland. Uh, well, in the, in that lots most of the energy in Queensland is is publicly owned rather than in South Australia it's privately owned. Um, yeah, so there'd be different um, kind of rules and regulations to to figure out, but definitely at a smaller scale there's there's room for community energy projects that are about getting um, sort of behind the meter solar installed on say large community organization buildings or on say a you know a, a fire station or you know there's lots of different things that can be done um, that would not involve those problems and I think there's a really big opportunity for community investment in large scale renewables in, in South Australia as well. And that, that won't be pre prevented um, through, through the, the network rules, that that's more a relationship and financial arrangement with the developers. Thank you. And a question here for Laurie, he's just rephrased it, so we better get it in here. So um, every member of every C4C member organisation has a consumer data right. The ACCC will implement the energy CDR this year. Have the CCB thought about ways that their members can benefit from the consumer's data right? I'll take that one on notice as well, Laurie, but I thought maybe we'll just bring up a bit if anyone's got some experience working with, you know, using um, community members' data or during some of the projects that they might be doing as well. And is it, is it as easy as it sounds once the ACCC actually passes it? Taryn, I am looking at you because I know you're involved in one program with Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, was, I wasn't sure if you were just answering it. Um, I mean, what I, what I would love to have so much is when you, walk, when you walk or drive into the Hepburn Shire, there's a sign there and it says exactly what people are doing with their electricity and what the wind farm's doing and you know, all the rest of it, our local battery storage facility, because this will be in the future, and that we've got, you know, a platform online where people can also check it out. So, look, I think um, you can you can do that stuff in, in Europe. I've been to lots of villages where they've got those sorts of, um, you know, education portals, uh, you know, available for, for, for their community, and that would be ideal. Uh, um, you know, there's lots of other things you can do with your data, but just, just as a starting point, I think it would be a really good um, literacy building and awareness building tool for communities. Yeah, and I think also, um, you know, as we're seeing with the smart meters rollout in Victoria, which was supposed to be all for consumers' benefit, have consumers actually benefit from their access to that data? Um, and that's a really up for question at the moment. So, because it is still quite hard for people to, for third parties to get access and for people to release their data as well. So I think it's a space that needs a, a bit more work. So. Thanks, Laurie. Might be a question that we can put on the C4C Knowledge Hub, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. It's five to seven, so I'm going to have to start wrapping things up. So, but first, I want to ask each of the panelists what is the next thing that you want people to do after this webinar and what they need to do for making 2021 the year for advocacy on community energy? So, I might start with you, Andrew. Uh, look, again, I think if there are people on the call who are in the renewable energy zones, um, I think talking with your local community, with your local MPs and councillors around, around the opportunities uh, for community ownership um, is, is a really great start. Um, and if you're not, then you get on board with Repower Our Communities. That's my suggestion. It sounds like your turn then, Christy. <laughs> yeah, the perfect segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would say um, come along to the webinar um, next week at 7pm, so on Wednesday as well, um, if you can. Otherwise, um, head to uh, repowerourcommunities.org.au and sign up to the, the list there. Um, what we're going to be doing is um, producing a bunch of, of case studies and sort of community energy collateral that you can take to, to meet with your local MP to show them, look, we're a community group or I'm someone that wants to support community energy. Here's the data that shows that it's um, a good thing and here's a community that's already done it and what they've achieved. I'd love to see that happen in my community. Can you help? Um, uh, with the idea of, you know, the more MPs that we can get um, on board and that this is federal MPs, then the, the greater the chance that um, 
a bill like the local power plant or something similar, because often, um, you know, other opposition or other government MPs will say, well, I like that idea, I'm going to create my own bill. Um, you know, there's a chance that um, it'll get up and then we'll have more um, capacity building and support to, to see many more of these projects happen around the country. Thanks, Christy. And Taryn? Uh, so sign the uh, C4C petition for the community energy target. It's, it's a joint petition with uh, Friends of the Earth, the, the Yes to Renewables campaign campaign and we've had 718 signatories already and we really want to get to 1200 uh, and what we're why it's timely is because we're, we're leading up to the next budget and also leading up to the timeline that the government has to respond to the recommendations from the parliamentary inquiry so the parliamentary inquiry recommends a community energy target we really want to see it implemented um, in the not too distant future. Cool. Excellent. Thanks, Taryn. Now, Murray, I think we might put up a couple of slides and at least have to put up for the C4C Knowledge Hub. So we're putting the chat there a couple of links and we'll send out an email out to people as well with more actions that you can do. Um, I just also want to say thank you to all our presenters and their time that they've done today for, the, um, for this webinar. And also thank you for all the people who participate as well and your questions. It's great to see so many people who join us online and we've seen so much interest in what work that we're doing. This is my big plug to have to put that if you've got some more questions that we haven't answered or you want to connect with people who are on this webinar tonight to go to the C4C Knowledge Hub. So that's c4c.org.au. This is a website that we started up last year, knowing that we couldn't do a lot of our face-to-face -face and our, our triennial conference. We actually developed a whole new knowledge hub and online space for people to talk to each other, as well as there's hundreds of articles and resources on there as well. And this webinar will actually end up being another resource on that knowledge hub. So go and check it out if you haven't already. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening and especially a big thank you for Murray who's in the background there, who's done all the work we're pulling this all together. Thank you very much. And also thank you to Heather Smith, our colleague at the C4CE who helped put it together as well. And I hope you all have a good night and take care. So thank you. <laughs>